Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another Lightroom workshop. This is the third in my series of strictly Lightroom, if we expand it to the one where I talk about web design for photographers. Well, fourth workshop in the series over the last couple of weeks. I've had a lot of fun bringing you this content, and I look forward to what we're talking about today. As I was putting this together, I was like, oh, I might be the most excited about this. But then I thought, all right, hold on. That one about local area adjustments was awesome. And then, of course, there's the basics that I already covered of the complete workflow of how I get my pictures in and kind of get organized right from the beginning. That's great, too. I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I'm pretty proud of this content that I've been putting out. And I really appreciate the emails and comments that you all have been sending and leaving that say the same. You really appreciate this and really appreciate that it's 100% free. Uh, so speaking of free things, first off, I would love for you to follow me on social media, Photorec Toby, Instagram, and Twitter. A follow in both of those locations is very nice. And if you're watching this and you're not already a subscriber, I'd love for you to hit that subscribe and the thumbs up button. Although, as I said in the last workshop, you can wait a few minutes to make sure I know what I'm talking about. And these free handouts that I'm talking about, I've simplified the URL. You can get back to all of the previous workshops. They're all still 100% available and the handouts. They're all different multi-page PDFs, um, anywhere from 19 pages. This one happens to be 13 pages at photorec.tv slash Lightroom. So you go to those, you will find links to everything that you need. If you are our pen, if you are a pen member and you're watching this, you got emailed this PDF today. So go check your inbox. It's sitting there for you. And a reminder to pen members and anybody who's considered joining, um, I will be hosting only for pen members a live workshop next week, uh, a little bit later in the evening, 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And the goal of that is uh, really just to answer your questions live. It's going to be smaller. Our community is smaller than when I broadcast live to all of my subscribers. And I really want to make sure that I'm there for you to ask questions and get answers in video format live. So if you are struggling with Lightroom and you're not a pen member, consider joining. Right now, it's just $24 for your first year. $24. As I put out an email earlier today, I challenge you to find any place else that offers the level of instructional information and, most importantly, awesome community with interactions with professional photographers, myself included. If you've got you know, needs, Lightroom, photography, Photoshop, we're here for you. And we've got answers, and I'm really proud of the value that we're answering. In chat room, those of you who are joining live and watching today, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. As I've said in previous workshops, your questions make this so much better. You ask great questions. If you've got that question in your mind, I'm pretty sure at least a couple other people watching have it as well. So I really appreciate those. As we've done in previous workshops, Roy will be collecting those questions. It's nice if you put a big Q, the letter Q in front of it. And at certain break points, when it makes sense, I'll stop and uh, answer those as best I can. But again, pen members, you're going to get that special workshop just for you next week. And if you're not a pen member, well, you certainly have time to join. You can learn more about that at photorec.tv slash Lightroom. It's all right there. So it's very, very easy. You can also go to photorec.tv slash pen. I love it. Everybody sharing where they're from and what the weather's like. Uh, we have had a stretch of absolutely gorgeous weather here in Seattle. Looks like we're going to start to get back to some rain, which I'm actually happy about because our garden needs it. But it's been absolutely beautiful. And I just want to wish again everyone out there uh, continued safe and healthiness and hope that continues for as long as we need it to. All right. I do want to show you real quick one advertisement for Penn, the Photo Enthusiast Network. So uh, that is what we're offering, $24 a year. You log in, and not only do you get access to a fantastic community through the Facebook group and a forum, so if you're not a Facebook user, there is a community available for you as well. But today, I just want to dive into the Tuesday tips. Each Tuesday, you get delivered to your inbox an article on a variety of subjects. This is written by other professional photographers, including myself, David, Ali, Steve. Um, we have shared this content over the years, and it's all here 
So if you're just joining now, you're like, well, how do I see all of them? We've got this spot on the website. And there are just tons and tons of content from very specific, detailed, step-by-step -step directions on certain techniques to this great suggestion, take time for you, talking about health and wellness as a photographer, how to create a custom signature watermark. That's very popular. A lot of you want to do that. That was a guest post from Roy. So we've got lots of fantastic content in here. That's just the Tuesday tips. Let's see, we've been running now for all of 2018 and 2019 plus uh, 2020, uh, hundreds? Yeah, over a hundred tips right there, just waiting for you, plus of course, all of that video information and all of that other stuff. It's just a lot of great, fantastic content. And one more time, just for anybody joining us just a little bit late, uh, photorec.tv slash Lightroom is the one simplified link that I've created that gets you to all of the previous workshops, all of the previous handouts, and today's handouts. But pen members, please just check your email. You were delivered this earlier today in a direct link. All right. So as I said, I'm excited about this workshop because uh, this one is where I, I share some of the stuff that didn't really fit into the flow of the others, but is really critical and really important for staying on top. I, there are two main aspects to Lightroom, right? It's the whole kind of organizing your files and the editing side. And today, mostly we're going to talk about organizing because you can't really get to the editing until you start to feel organized. Figuring out which pictures you like, which pictures you want to spend time on, figuring out how to get back to those favorite pictures easily without driving yourself crazy. And what we're going to start with here is figuring out how to find lost files and folders. I do offer one-on-one -on -one help where I connect with you, take control of your computer while you watch and we talk through. And 90% of what I've been doing over the last couple of weeks, as many people have found themselves with a little extra time on their hand, is helping them kind of consolidate and find lost files. Uh, so I know if you, and all of them, all of them say this to me, oh, Toby, I'm so embarrassed. You're going to see my mess. You know what? I've got messes too. I just happen to kind of, you know, do those messes a few years earlier. I'm just a few years ahead of you. That's the only difference. I used to be in that same boat and understand. Um, and so there's no judgment there. And I want to share some tips and tricks for you to you that will help you with this. Okay. So that's stuff out of the way. Let's just jump right into talking about Lightroom and finding lost files and folders. Again, this uh, packet goes through this in some pretty good detail. But I kind of want to start with the um, point that Lightroom does not store your photos. Remember this, folks. Lightroom is a catalog system that stores the locations of your photos. Your photos, the master files, they exist somewhere, either on your computer or maybe an external hard drive or, or a combination of both. Lightroom doesn't care. You can have them on 16 different hard drives if you want. Lightroom's okay with that. But what happens is that you might unplug one of those hard drives one day or something might goof up and a hard drive might get a new name or you might move a file or folder outside Lightroom, not thinking about it, and then the next time Lightroom runs, you're like, oh, well, where are those files and folders? Lightroom is not smart enough to constantly monitor what you are doing outside of Lightroom. Maybe you know we'd like that, or maybe we'd feel like it's constantly spying on us and judging us, so maybe not. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to start up here. I've got my 2019 photos. We're, we're in my gigantic, huge archive of all past photos. I have two catalogs. I covered this in great detail in that first workshop. I'm going to try not to repeat myself too much to save time. And you can see right here, I've got an issue. I've got this folder at the beginning of 2019 that looks different than all of the rest. It's got a little question mark next to it. And in addition to that, up in the top right corner of each of these pictures in this folder, I've got a little question mark, or sorry, an exclamation point. And then over here on the right hand side, I have this photo is missing. Well, that's not, that's not good. What happens when a photo is missing? Let's see, if I double click it, wow, it still looks pretty good. I can see it. I can even zoom in sometimes. Sometimes you can. But notice that my develop stuff, I can't do any developing to it. And if I move over here and go to the basic panel, 
It's all grayed out. I can't do anything. Which, just for your information, this is actually the same if you stop paying Lightroom. If you do the Creative Cloud and you pay them monthly and then you say, hold on, I'm taking a break. Um, this is the same thing that happens. They don't, your photos don't go missing, but you get locked out of editing. You can still find them and all that stuff. That's just kind of an aside. Okay, so what do we do? Well, let's go back to the grid view. We can, of course, click this little icon that pops up and says, hey, couldn't be found. Would you like to locate it? And it tells me where it last knew that it was. It's kind of a detective, last seen at address. Well, you know what? We're not going to do that because all of these photos are missing. And of course, we use a little common sense. We look over and the folder itself has that question mark. It's missing as well. Anytime that happens, when you right click on it, you get this find missing folder or you could remove it. So if you've deleted it outside Lightroom and you're like, yeah, that folder is full of terrible pictures. I don't want Lightroom to know about that anymore. Well, then just remove it. But these are some pictures that, that I want to stick around. So find missing folder. It's going to pop you into your Finder or Explorer window. Yes, I'm using this on a Mac. You're seeing a Mac, but the steps are exactly the same. Just the windows and the names of things are just a little bit different. So it pops me into the Instagram folder. Well, that, that's not where I'm working. I work off of uh, Redwood and then Photos. So let me get back into Photos. There we are. Uh, 2019 photos. And um, well, I can arrange them so that look, let's put them next to each other. Here we go. Birding with Fiona, birding with Fiona. Then it jumps to Sony event, Sony event. Yeah, okay, this folder's missing. Did it accidentally get renamed or something? Nope, I don't see anything else. So let's, let's do a search for it. Uh, I'm just going to put my search box again on Windows. You'd have a search box as well. Mavic 2 Flights. And it found two folders. This one, and they're both, uh, one's inside the other. But look at this, photos, 2019 photos. Oh, dill sync files. Somehow, this accidentally got put in the delete synced files. I use a little program to keep two drives synced up, and something must have gone wrong. That can happen, or as I did earlier today for this example, I just stuck it in there so that I could share with you kind of how to search and find it. So there it is. So I could just choose it now. That's one thing. Or I could go to its location and move it back to where it should be. Both are going to do the same thing for the most part. But watch. So let's just choose it. Choose. And what we're going to see happen over here is it's going to think for a moment and it's going to update its directions and now say, hey, Inside the Dell Sync folder is this other folder of the Mavic 2 flights that you've now made me re-aware of where these directions are. Think of uh, a way to describe this is if you give Lightroom direct sorry, if you give somebody directions to the grocery store down the street from your house, you know, they're out front, they're like, where is that grocery store? And you say, take a left, take a right, take a left. And they get halfway down the street and then they kind of forget your directions they need to be repointed from that point. Well, you've already made your left and your right. Now you just need to make a second left. And then you're there. That's what we're doing with Lightroom. Does that make sense? People like that. So now that I have it, well, it's I don't want it in that Dell Sync folder. And this is where you can stay out of trouble. You can move folders and files inside Lightroom. You don't have to do it outside Lightroom and then do all of this higgly jiggly stuff behind the scenes. I can simply just drag and drop it out of that folder. And here it is, Mavic 2 Flights. I could have also moved it in the Finder and then it would have reappeared, but this way. And then I've got this Dell Sync folder. I don't know, there's no photos in it. I don't have any reason to keep that inside. So I'm just going to remove it. And we're back to normal. So the steps for finding a lost folder. Right click on it and say find a missing folder. Search for its name across your computer. Watch out though, if you've got multiple folders with a similar name or same name, you want to make sure you're connecting it to the right one. We're going to look at that specific example in just a moment with pictures. So let's move on to um, this, I think it's the Evo SD drone. Yeah. All right. Let's go in here 
and I've got a couple of pictures that are uh, starred. And over here on the right hand side, we've got original plus smart preview for this picture. Now this picture says just original photo. This picture says smart preview. And this picture says photo is missing. So I've set this example up as, as basically the four categories that you could have for any single picture in your library or group of pictures. A smart preview, well, I've talked about in previous workshops a little bit, and I there's a little bit of language in here at the bottom of the first page of the handout, which is at photorec.tv slash Lightroom. Um, smart previews are these kind of neat intelligent raw files that are much smaller than your original files. They're mostly designed for laptop users to be able to have the catalog and the smart previews on the laptop, have the masters stored on an external hard drive so that when you're bumping down the road on, the bat, on a bus or you're flying in the sky, eventually we'll all be doing that again, you can work and edit these pictures without that clunky hard drive attached. It's pretty cool. You can edit, rank them, um, your keyword. Uh, you can even export social media sized ones from smart previews. But when you want to get the original out in all of its beauty of editing, you just plug that external hard drive back in and boom, it all works. It's pretty cool. That's the use of smart previews. They also can be useful for some people on older machines. Um, use them for editing instead of the originals, but be because they're smaller, uh, they will speed up the performance of that. We can talk about that in another workshop down the road. But it's something to explore. If you're frustrated with Lightroom's kind of sluggishness at times, you might want to look in the preferences and enable smart preview editing. Um, so on my desktop machine, usually smart previews don't make a lot of sense for me because my hard drives are always attached. That is where I'm storing my pictures. But this photo, this means that not only did I build a smart preview for it, but it also still knows where the original photo is and has access to it at this very moment. The next picture over original photo, that just means that only the original photo uh, is in its system. And I did not ask it to build a smart preview for this one. The next one, smart preview is the only one created sorry, is the preview that was created for this file, it does not have access to the original anymore. And so that's going to limit how much you can zoom in and zoom out in the dimensions of the image. Because again, smart previews are generally smaller than your original RAWs in resolution and file size. And again, you see all of my editing tools are here. This is pretty cool. I can you know, make changes to it and, and make those adjustments uh, as I want, um, even though I don't have access to the original. That's cool. And the hope is that I don't have access right now because maybe I just unplugged that hard drive temporarily, right? And then finally, this one, I didn't build a smart preview and it doesn't know where it is currently. So we're back to that kind of same issue of, well, I can't do anything with it. I can't develop it. I can see this preview. And this is because I've, I've made these changes recently. If Lightroom has lost the connection to these pictures and a period of time goes on, it does start to even lose these little thumbnails. So it won't even really show you what you are holding there. So keep that in mind. Now, I'm going to click this little exclamation point right here. It says, OK, this 2019-0115 Dronefly Max 015 JPEG could not be used because the original file could not be found. Would you like to locate it? And it tells me where it was originally. So let me, what I usually do is in this little dialog, I highlight and copy that bit of text that is its file name. And I'm going to hit Locate. It's going to pop me into this folder. And now I can just paste that file name in here. And look, it found it, except it has a little text appended at the beginning that just says, oops. Well, again, that was me setting up this example. In a lot of cases, it's more likely that that file exists outside the folder. It got moved for some reason. You were doing something. You were collecting your favorite little pictures. And you forgot my speeches in earlier workshops where I say, don't cheat on Lightroom. Do all of your moving and organizing within Lightroom. Otherwise, as I said, Lightroom's not monitoring you 24-7. And if you move a file outside Lightroom, you're breaking those directions. So 
let's just fix this really easily by um, renaming it and taking off the oops. And then we can just say select. And we'll watch. Ooh, there. Um, boom. It now is the original photo. That's pretty cool. And so smart preview is here. Photo is missing or offline, but it can still be edited using its smart preview. So if we want to discard the smart preview and search for it, we can do that. But I want to show you one other thing to be very cautious about. And I talk about this in the um, handout. Let's go down. I've got a little collection called Teaching somewhere, Teaching Workshop 3. I've got this fun picture of my daughter um, in, the, in the stream, fully committed to a good waterfall picture. Love her. Uh, photo is missing. Well, that's a bummer. Look at this file. So that last one, you, you saw my file name. It had the date. It had some custom text and then the original file name. And you might have think like, oh, that's a long file name. Yeah, but it was a unique file name. Watch what happens now. Let's say, OK, yeah, photo is missing. I can click this photo is missing too. Sure, let's copy this. In this case, I'm just going to copy part of the file name, not the CR3, because that is kind of specific. And um, I'm going to do a search. Image 002. Oh, hold on now. Well, we've got one of them, two of them, three of them, four of them, five of them. I've got five image 0002s, and you can tell they're different things. They're different dates. Yeah, remember, our cameras have odometers. Like our cars, they eventually roll over. For most of us, it's about 10,000 pictures. Or at 9,999 pictures, it starts over again at 002. So I bring this up, and I show this example because I implore you, go back and watch my first workshop if you didn't already and learn how to rename on import so that every single file that comes in gets a unique and custom name. I tell you, the folks that I've been helping over the last couple of weeks in the one-on-one -on -one to work one -on -one workshops, 90% of um, the time spent in figuring out what's missing and what's there is matching up. Is this the actual file to this file name? And a lot of times you can tell from the dates. Like, all right, over here, March 9th of last year, just about a year ago. OK, well, look, there it is. There's the date. So that's not too hard to do. But it's just kind of a bummer to have to spend any time doing that. And it's really nice to be able to put in the file name of the missing photo and have it take you to the one and only file name of that photo that matches. Does that make sense? Um, I know we haven't we haven't I haven't spoken for too long, but let me quick see what you've got for questions about that because I want to see um, uh, what you think about this. Tom says I have stored lots of photos in an external drive for backup that I keep unplugged. If I plug it in, will Lightroom find the photos there without me directing it to the hard drive? So Tom, it depends on how you've put those fo photos on there as backup. But the way you say that makes me think that you didn't do it as part of Lightroom. So if you didn't make Lightroom put those photos there, Lightroom has no idea those photos are there. What you can do is plug that drive in and then tell Lightroom to import from that drive. And you can ask it to copy them to someplace else to consolidate, or you can ask it to um, just bring them in uh, and leave them where they are and allows you to kind of then drag and drop within the Lightroom interface. But Lightroom isn't smart enough to just be like, oh, you've plugged in a drive with photos. Let me help you out there with it. It will with SD cards and th some thumb drives, but not in general, too. Um, Laurie wants to know if your Lightroom catalog lives on your laptop and you back up, let's go full, let's go full screen for me and you back up your Lightroom catalog on the same external drive as your files, will Lightroom know where to look if you have to use your backup catalog? That's a great question, and the answer is no. So Laurie's asking, you've got your catalog on your laptop, you've got your photos on an external. And so you think about the directions that catalog uses to get to the external. Well, it takes a left at your USB port, and it goes to volume two, and it connects to it. 
if you put the backup Lightroom catalog on this drive right next to those photos, it's going to follow that same direction path and it's going to be confused. It is, however, very easy to connect it. So let's hold on to that question because I think I touch on this a little bit. Yeah, on the back of page, page two, on page two of the handout, I talk in a little bit more detail about this. Um, so let's let's look now here and we and if I didn't get your question, we'll get more of them. Don't worry. So look over here on my left hand side. I'm in the library still. And in the folder section, the top of every folder is actually a drive. These are volumes. Sometimes we call them volumes. Sometimes we call them drives. And notice that the only one that Lightroom is actually aware of being plugged in and on right now is the Redwood. How do I know that? It's the only one that's bright and it's got a little green light next to it. That means that there's plenty of space available. Uh, you might find that uh, you have some that are bright with a yellow. That just means that it's getting kind of full and you should start thinking about replacing it. Um, the reason I have so many that aren't plugged in right now is because remember, this catalog is a mashup of all my previous catalogs. And so there are times where there was something temporarily on this drive or that drive, and as I mash them together, it keeps that in its memory and it's messy. I should go through and remove those locations, honestly. Some of them do have, when I plug them back in though, do have older pictures on them that I would like to pull in, like the 2014s. So the reason I bring this up now is, uh, you might have that drive plugged in and it still thinks it isn't. There's occasionally where the volume will actually get its name changed. It, it usually shouldn't happen, but it does. And then you simply need to reconnect your top level folder with the top level folder on the drive. And if you're struggling, let's say, here, let's do this for a second. Let's hide parent folder. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not seeing that. It won't. Oh, I should have a hide this folder. Uh, okay, let's go to this one and say hide this parent or show parent folder, hide this parent. That's what I'm looking for. It lets you in Lightroom expand the list of folders. So we can say show parent and now it's gonna be this, this volume folder on here in a second. There it is, Redwood 17. So you can simply if you're opening, in this case, opening your Lightroom backup and you want to reconnect it, or you have a drive that it's forgotten and it's connected, you just go to that very top level domain, repoint that folder or reconnect that folder, and all of the rest of the ones underneath will fall in line. So I hope that makes sense. Terry's asking, can you have your Lightroom on an external drive? Uh, Terry, we want to make sure we're talking, there's the Lightroom, the program, and then there's Lightroom, the catalog. And you should go back and watch my original workshop some. Um, Lightroom, the program has to live on your computer, but your catalog can absolutely live on an external drive. It just means that if that catalog, if that drive isn't plugged in, you don't have access to the catalog. So keep that in mind there as well. And E. Leher says, uh, I don't really need smart previews that I've created. Is there a way to delete them? Does it matter? Yes and yes, they take up space. So let's go back. Um, there's a couple different ways. There's actually uh, tools that will show you pictures that have smart previews created. Try to remind me when I get into the collection section, which we're, we're headed towards. Um, but if you know, so let's go back. Let me come back into 2019. And I showed you that in the Evo drone with two stars, um, I created a smart preview for this file. Nope. Um, this one right here, or mm, I guess just this one. You can go to library previews, discard smart previews. And it does matter because they take up space. Not a ton, but certainly they take up space. And if you're not using them anymore, and if they don't help with the performance of your machine or your, your Lightroom, then certainly discard them. Also, we didn't talk a whole lot about this in the first workshop, uh, but you could also discard your one-to-one -one previews after a while as well. If you're not going back and editing these frequently, then they're just taking up space. And there's a default Lightroom setting that usually discards the one-to-ones after 30 days so that it, it kind of keeps the file uh, structure a little bit more manageable. If you go into your Lightroom folder where your catalog is and see the previews file sitting next to it, that's the big one. Uh, you know, gigabytes easily in size, even with just a couple thousand pictures. So keep that in mind um, as well. 
Jamie wants thoughts on de just deleting the library out of Lightroom after exporting. Just deleting library out of Lightroom after exporting. So you're saying, Jamie, you've deleted, you've exported the file as its finished product. Should you delete it in Lightroom? I think I'm understanding it right. And my answer is absolutely no, because what you're exporting is a JPEG usually. And what you have back in the catalog is a raw. And a week from now, a month from now, five years from now, you might have much better editing skills and Lightroom much be, might be much better at editing these photos. You always want access to any raw that's important to you. If it's a junky file, then again, watch that first workshop and see how I talk about getting rid of them as well. Adam, you have a great question. Uh, it's a little bit longer, but it's you have an old catalog that has some pictures you like. Let's go host large. Um, you have an old catalog with some pictures you like that you want to uh, bring into the new catalog. And of course, you could just get those pictures and import them. But any edits and ratings and rankings and keywords, you're going to lose. So Lightroom very nicely makes the ability to export as a catalog. So gather together those pictures that you do like and go to File, Export as Catalog. That's going to allow you to create this little temporary catalog and a folder of photos. You go to the new catalog and you say import and it will bring the photos and most importantly, all of those edits and rankings and keywords and all of that stuff. That That's crucial and I'm, you know, I'm glad that they do that. So I think I have answered all of these questions right now. Carol, do smart previews live on your computer or where you have your photos? They live wherever your Lightroom catalog is, which for almost all of us is our laptops themselves or our desktops um, on the hard drives of those machines. Uh, occasionally, some people keep all of that on their external together, but most people keep it. And most of the time, it's in your pictures or photos folder and then a Lightroom folder. That's the default location for Lightroom's catalog and all of the little extra associated files with that. All right, so um, we're moving on to talking about renaming. So I just had that little minor diatribe about please rename your files on import. And I have a preset and I show you in the first workshop exactly how to do that. I'm not going to go over all of that again, but let's go and I'll be real with you. There are some times that I'm messy, as you can see right here, a picture of my bedroom at the beginning of the Antarctica trip. Uh, that's not why I brought you here. Why I brought you here is apparently I accidentally brought in a group of pictures from Antarctica with uh, the custom text box empty. So when I import, I have a little rename scheme that sets up and renames them with the date they were captured, plus a little custom text, plus the original file name. So as you saw with some of these photos, that's a little bit long, but it's instantly useful and recognizable. It tells you exactly where this file photo is, or where roughly it was taken, sorry, um, and the date it was captured at a glance without even having to look at the thumbnail itself. Um, and I just really, really like that. So if I come in here and we go to the grid view, so G, and we go to text, and I search for untitled, that's what happens if you forget to add any text. So the file name of like this first picture right here is 2019-01-31, untitled, and then the original file name. You see that right down there in the little corner? Well, that's a bummer. So that means if I'm going and finding my two-star Antarctica pictures, I also, look, I haven't even tagged this Antarctica. So this photo is going to be lost to me. So I really, really strongly recommend naming files and also making sure you stay on top of your file naming and occasionally searching your catalog for anything called untitled if you're using my method. Luckily, there's a way to fix this. So you can go to library rename photos. And I say luckily too, because many of you might be watching this and I hope you're like, oh yeah, Toby's a pretty smart guy. I should name my files because, and I said, I, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I get excited here because when you rename your files with some descriptive text, not only is it then searchable in Lightroom under that text, it's also searchable outside Lightroom. 
So if I search my computer for Antarctica, I want all of these pictures and videos to come up together, whether I'm using Lightroom or not. So you may want to go back and rename files, and Lightroom makes it very easy to do that. It's library, rename photos. And that brings up this little dialog right here. Now, my standard renamer is my import rename. I run that every time I import pictures. Uh, let's look at what that does real quick. Again, it's covered in the first workshop. It appends the date it was captured, not the date of import. It's smart enough to do that. The date it was captured, plus the little custom text, plus the original file name, right? And that means that when I import, if I have this custom text blank, it helpfully sticks in untitled. Um, I'd say hopefully because that's better than blank because searching for blank is a pain in the butt. Uh, so I got to put stuff in there. But look, I can't, I can't reuse this retitler because look what happens. It's going to take the untitled and stick new stuff on it. You want to see what I'm saying? This might be a little confusing. But because the file name got made from uh, DSC 0002082 to the date untitled in that number. I can't just rename it with my import rename. I have a special, it's called do untitled renamer. Let's look at what this does. So go to edit. This one is very, very similar, except critically, it's not just file name, it's original file name. So it's smart enough to say, OK, on import, we changed it from its original. But let's go back, get just the original, and stick on the stuff that we're supposed to. And so I say done. And now I can say Antarctica. And I think I even spelled it right. Hmm. See, this happens sometimes. This is great. It didn't happen to me earlier. So look, it's still making a really long file name there. You see that? So there's another original, um, let's say, preserved file name. No. So it's been corrupted, and now it thinks the original file name is the renamed file name. So you might have to do, yeah, original number suffix. And then you, I know this seems confusing, but it's worth it. Then you type in whatever little extension your camera uses, the DSC or IMG. So now we're going to get that. There we go. So you might have to. If you want help with that and, and yours is funny, you can send me an email. I'll talk a little bit more about that. But it's basically using the original file name or the original number so that you end up with something better. Let's um, call this. We're going to save this current preset as a new one. I'm going to call it Dole Untitled Renamer. Um, suffix. Create. All right, done. So now that one will be there. If the do untitled renamer isn't working for me, then I can go back to that one and I can say OK. And it's renaming that image for me. And notice that that image just disappears because it no longer has the word untitled as part of the keyword, so it doesn't come up in the search anymore. Let me select all of these real quick. Library, rename photos. Antarctica looks like it's going to be good. Hit OK. And there goes 39 images. Now, up until this point, you know, I was blissfully unaware that I had Antarctica images that were in the Antarctica folder but weren't named Antarctica. And certain searches that I use means that those don't come up and those aren't uh, available to me. You might have a small enough number of photos that uh, that doesn't really matter to you. But, but think about it a year from now or five years from now, and we're going to get into these uh, collections here in a second, which really allow you to easily collate pictures from across folders and things of that sort. So let's take another quick break for a couple of questions. Um, Robert says, how do you clear old previews? My previews have gone to 60 gigs, and I have to keep previews to one week. So that was, let's go out of the untitled search here. And here I am in Antarctica. You can select these photos, go to Library, Previews, and Discard. That's how you can do that, Robert. 
John says, any idea why Lightroom won't read any of my SD cards? I have to move all photos to a desktop folder first. It didn't used to do this. Seems regardless of reader or USB. John, make sure that you are looking in the subfolders of those SD cards as well. Although there's one other person who I'm emailing back and forth with right now with a similar issue. It just all of a sudden has happened to them. And I, I'm hoping just to kind of connect uh, with them and see if I can figure it out so that I can help and have an answer in the future. I'm not sure. Um, and John, you want to move all your photos to an external instead of the internal. What's the best steps? Uh, the best steps, I think, is to do it right in Lightroom. And um, I have shown that in great detail in a specific Lightroom video that is available for pen members. But basically, you want to plug that external in and you want to create a new folder in Lightroom on that external. As soon as you do that, Lightroom will then be aware of that drive and be like, oh, I know about this drive. What do you want to do with it? Then from Lightroom, you can literally drag and drop, as I did a few moments ago when I moved that file folder out of Delete Sync. You can drag and drop that onto that external drive. And Lightroom will be happy because you're doing it inside Lightroom. Don't do it outside Lightroom because then it doesn't know you've done that. And then you have to go through the Fix It, Find It feature. Sue, when importing into Lightroom, should I import JPEG and RAW? You have the camera set up to do both when you take a photo. Talked about this a little bit in the first workshop. Um, I typically do, if, I've, if I'm shooting with a camera that shoots both, um, I import both. And then after I'm sure all of the RAWs are in and happy, I delete the JPEGs. I do a search for the JPEG file type and delete them. They are just for me insurance. No other reason for keeping them around. Uh, re uh, Becky, you say, can you rename a group of photos at one time? I accidentally imported into one folder without changing the custom text, and I had a bunch with the wrong name. Yeah, I think I just showed that, right, Becky? So just select a group of them and do that uh, rename. And you can select, let's say I wanted, I needed to, let's say, for instance, that these four, oops, weren't Antarctica. Or you better yet, you know what? I think there was, if we go back to the Sony event, um, this isn't a Sony event. Those are pictures that I think my daughter captured. Uh, and then it's a Sony event. So somehow I accidentally imported these. They're called Fiona Birds. Uh, so they are named right. But let's say I needed within this folder to rename those. I can select them. And then I can go to Library, Rename Photos, and I can make the adjustments as I need to for those pictures. So um, easy peasy. You can do it within a folder, or you can do um, just select a group of them. It's You have to do it in the grid view. You know what I think is funny is sometimes, and I forget this too, it looks, you can select multiple images down at the bottom in the film strip, but you can't affect multiple images at the same time. Does that make sense? You have to do it up in the grid view up above. All right, good questions. Kevin, your question, uh, you've got your photos in Dropbox. I'm afraid to import them all into Lightroom CC because of limited st cloud storage capacity. Suggestions? No. I'm sorry. That's why I don't really use Lightroom CC much. So Kevin, you're a pen member. Let's work together a little bit more and talk, uh, come up with some strategies for that um, where I can give you some more time than what we're talking about right now. OK. Let's move on to collections. Virtual folders. I touched on this a little bit. I actually touched on it mostly during the website building for photographers um, because collections are a fantastic way to start to get organized. What are collections? Before we get to what are collections, let's make sure we all know what folders are. So over here, we're looking at these folders. This is exactly what's on my hard drive. Nothing here is different from what's on my hard drive. Uh, and if I make a new folder here, so let's say I say add folder or subfolder, when I do that, it brings up a Finder or Explorer window. I am making this on the drive. Folders are exist in reality outside Lightroom, and you can view them inside Lightroom. That's what a folder is. A collection is very different, but seems similar. It's a little conundrum, isn't it? So a collection is a virtual folder. It exists only inside Lightroom. So I've got a collection called Best Photos. I click on it, and here are my best photos. If I go looking on my hard drive for best photos, don't have it. There's no such thing outside Lightroom. So you might say, well, why do I want to use it then? I don't like that. I want it to be inside and outside Lightroom. Yes, but here's the power of it. 
These best photos, I haven't taken them from where they are. They still exist in their different locations, the Italy 2015 fold or 2014 folder, um, you know, in Iceland 2015, in Paris, uh, Cuba. I mean, these pictures exist in Lightroom in their own nice little folders, but a collection virtually brings them together based on either your desire or some kind of criteria. In this case, the criteria was, do I like this picture? Does it represent this location as I'm putting this website together? And I have literally just dragged and dropped, or I'll show you how to add pictures to collections. So let's, let's open this up and um, best landscape. You can make a collection a target collection. Actually, back up real quick. Let me make sure we know that at the very top, there are, even if you've never used collections within Lightroom, you actually have. There are these collections built in all photographs. Think about it. When you click all photographs, it doesn't care how many hard drives and folders you know exist across your Lightroom. It just pulls them all in. It, uh, you get some real random stuff here right in the middle of my catalog. Um, it just pulls them all in from all of those locations. And this is all photographs. Then you got the synced. And then you have this idea of a quick collection which um, is kind of a random collection right now of some different pictures, my daughter's cat and uh, or pets and some nice waterfall photos. A quick collection is just simply a standard collection, a default collection that Lightroom has created there for you, sitting there and, and I used to kind of temporarily hold pictures. I needed to find a couple of pictures of, of Fiona's cat, Tino, and got them all in there. Previous import, that is a collection. Every time you import the last most recent import sits there. That's great because occasionally when you're not paying attention, you accidentally put those pictures in the wrong spot and then you're trying to find them down in your folders. We'll go up to the collection previous import. They'll be there and then you can say, hey, where are you guys? And you can find them. But then of course you can make collections down here. Now the quick collections currently has a little plus sign next to it. That means that it is set as the target collection and it's very easy to add pictures to the target collection. You can simply just click the picture and press the B as in butterfly, bravo, bravo key. So um, let's say, let's, let's take a look at Antarctica for um, Antarctica calendar and say, well, this, this is a pretty nice landscape picture. I want it to be in best landscape. Well, a couple things I could do. I could right click and say set as target collection. Best landscape now has the plus sign next to it. And that means that with this picture selected, I can press the B key. And look, add to target collection. And look, the number is now 22. Were you paying attention before? It was 21, now it's 22. Cool. Um, I could scroll through. If I find another picture I really like, well, I can add this one, B. Oh, it was already in there. Look, the number went down. I already had decided I like that one. There is no indication that it's already in that uh, collection other than if it's the default target collection, it gets this little gray button in the top right corner. So keep an eye out for that. I could drag and drop into that collection as well. And again, remember though, if I right click on this and I say, go to folder in library, it's gonna take me to the folder where it still exists. The collection is virtual. It is, think of it as kind of like a, a keywords that are being pulled together. So these are just collections that I've made and physically added the pictures to either by pressing the B key as the target collection or just dragging and dropping them in there. It's pretty handy. So that's um, collections there. Uh, you can also select a group of pictures. Let's let's say uh, that I've got um, these four right here. I could do command N and that's going to create a collection and I can say include the selected photos and I could say um, clients taking photos. And so these four photos that I've selected are now suddenly going to go into a new collection called uh, clients taking photos. So you can do it that way as well. You can select the photos first and then in one fell swoop, create the collection and move them all in there both. All right. So collections are really, really cool. Page six talks just some suggestions of different ideas. I'm using this to kind of uh, collate my favorite travel pictures and then best astrophotography. And you can have these collection sets. So notice that you can have these kind of top level collections and within them, single individual collections that, that mean something to you. That's pretty cool. 
if you're a wedding photographer, example that we use here is maybe you have your collection set from the Emma and Rob wedding, and these are your favorites or your deliverables, the ones you delivered. You could separate it out by the getting ready bride, getting ready groom. So that makes it really easy when you're starting to put an album together. You don't have just have to kind of go through the folder, find the pictures. You've already got it all organized so very nicely. And there's another benefit to collections, and that is that when you move on to the develop panel or the book panel, notice that the folder you're working in it stays active down below, but the collections stay here. So notice the folder panel is gone when I'm in the develop panel. So if you didn't move into the develop module in the folder you wanted to, you got to go back to the library, find the folder, and go back to develop. But if you've created a collection that you're working within, it's very easy to move around between the collections without ever leaving the develop module. So that's another benefit of them there. All right. I'm seeing less questions about collections because I think they blow people's minds a little bit and you haven't really even started to work with them in a way to use them. But I really want to show this in a little bit more detail. Let's just go back to library though. So those are collections that, you know, powerful, but very manual. You are doing all of that work. Lightroom has tools that are going to allow you to set up these rules where Lightroom is going to do the work for you. The best example I can have is, let's say, um, Antarctica is not a good example. I've only been to Antarctica once. So, you know, I just go back to that Antarctica folder when I want to find my original, fa or my favorites. But Yellowstone, I've been to Yellowstone, where'd it go? Uh, several times, Yellowstone faves. And so Lightroom has this idea of smart collections. They're incredibly powerful. So I'm going to go in here and say, edit this smart collection. Smart collection, give it a name. And then you just set up a bunch of rules. I, I love this stuff. Maybe this means I really am a true nerd at heart, but I just love being able to set up automatic rules that Lightroom is constantly watching for. So here is a place it's constantly watching that if it satisfies it, it'll pull into this collection. So I've been to Yellowstone in, you know, I don't know, five or six times over the last couple of years. Uh, and so I have any searchable text contains Yellowstone. So on import, I rename those pictures. Almost always they get the Yellowstone tag to them. Or maybe I've keyworded them Yellowstone as well. And I mentioned keywords in here a little bit at the uh, in the about in the middle of the packet. And on one hand, I'm kind of embarrassed with how small an amount of information I give to keywording. I talked about it in the import dialog as well, because it really can be a critical piece of all of this uh, kind of staying organized. Um, but I don't do nearly as much specific keywording as I used to. I use a couple generals when I import. And then I really mostly rely on smartly renaming my files on import. So I've got Yellowstone, and then I've got a rating is greater than or equal to three stars. So this smart collection is constantly watching for any pictures that are tagged or named Yellowstone and have three stars or greater. And so here we are. So I've got, if I hover the mouse over it, you can see, I hope I'm not covering it. Let's just go just screen for a second. Down here in the bottom, you can see that that very first picture is from a 2015 trip. Then we scroll through a little bit, and then we've got um, this solo tree. This was a Yellowstone, part of a Yellowstone workshop. There wasn't actually a tiger loose in Yellowstone. Um, this tree right here, 2017 trip. And then we scroll on down back to the animals of Montana and that uh, activity some. And then we've got a, another 2017, a 2017, uh, 2019. So in one location, I have access to all of my very favorite Yellowstone National Park pictures, the ones that have, I've rated three stars or more. And to prove to you how this works, let's, let's just jump to this folder real quick. Show, go to folder and library. It's going to take me to this folder. And let's say that I just was in love with this little diagram here, this picture of the springs. And I wanted to make that a three star. Before I do that, let's go back down on the left-hand side for a second and remind ourselves that Yellowstone Faves currently has 50 pictures. If I take this picture and mark it a three star, notice that that number just automatically changed to 51. So now this sign picture is in there with all the rest of them in that collection. So 
as these smart preview, once these smart collections are created, it is constantly watching for any kind of um, anything that matches. So it's pretty cool and a really nice way. I mean, on the very base level, I think you should create a um, this one I think is set up to uh, a, a one that's just your favorite pictures. So I call this fave travels. It has to have a keyword containing travel and is greater than or equal to four stars. Well, let's take that rule out for a second and says um, five stars fave photos. And if you want to do the trick of an underscore in front, it'll come up at the top of the smart collections. So at the top of the smart collections, my very fave photos um, are going to be the ones that come up with five stars in this catalog. And it doesn't matter where they are in my catalog, boom, I now have this one place to go and look at them. And it will constantly watch. If I go back and I rate one of these as a five star, then boom, it's a five star. All right. Now, that is collections. But let's take it a little bit of a step further. There's a lot of a lot in the handout about this. I'm just going to touch on it a little bit, and that's the map module. Now, you might be thinking, you know, I'm not that much of a map nerd. I don't have a GPS. I don't have a way to tag my pictures. Oh, but you do. And oh, but this is powerful as well. So for instance, let's go back to a folder here that I've got, like let's say Alaska this past year. And um, I have tagged some of these pictures with their location, which is really cool. If I want to go back to that location, I can tag that, I can click that little icon that will take me back and show me exactly where I captured these photos. That's pretty handy. But let's say that um, I didn't tag the pictures. So maybe on um, my Rainier scouting trip. Did I tag them then? Let's see. I did. Let's find one where I didn't because I don't always do it. Bird walk. These pictures aren't tagged. So um, I've got pictures here that aren't tagged. You probably have pictures that aren't tagged either. Anything? Well, again, I don't need to see my pictures on the map, but this becomes, here's the crucial piece. This becomes another piece of information that you can use to find pictures that you're looking for. And I'll show you how. Trust me. Hang on. So let's go over to the map module. Um, all of these pictures down here. This is a bird walk. This was at a local park. I know exactly where this is. So I'm going to search Seattle and hit enter. It's going to take me to Seattle. I'm going to zoom in. And uh, these pictures were all down here in this little park. Herring's House Park. So watch this. I can grab all of these pictures. I selected all of them and I can drag and drop them on here. No, it's not going to be precise. And it's setting the GPS coordinates of every picture. And again, you might be like, hey, I don't really care. Watch this over here in a moment. If you have reverse geocoding lookup enabled, say that a couple times fast. If you have that enabled, when you drag and drop onto the map, Lightroom then goes and looks at location information online and says, you've given me this latitude and longitude that most normal people can't tell at a glance what it means. But look what it just did. It just filled in that this happened in the city of Seattle, province or state of Washington in the United States. This now is searchable by Seattle. So I could say, show me all of my pictures I've captured in Seattle. I didn't tag them with Seattle. I didn't rename them Seattle. They're renamed Birdwalk and Fiona's Pick. That's what they're called. But now they're searchable by the term Seattle. That is awesome. And you can actually even have location collections where you can create a radius around a point. And this is small, but look, what if we did West Coast? This is the picture that I have in the um, guide. Take us there. Oh, there we go. Give it a second, and it should. Oh, it's showing all those pictures from within this. Um, let me go back to grid view real quick. Let's go to all photos, back to map, and West Coast should come up with a few more. So 
I can say, show me all the pictures I've captured on the West Coast. And then I can come down to the bottom and say, show me my four stars that I've captured on the West Coast. So I don't even have to say, show me Seattle plus or Washington plus Oregon or Washington, and Oregon and Nevada. I just simply drew a circle on the map and Lightroom found all of these pictures for me that I've tagged either because I had a camera that had GPS or I just dragged and dropped them onto the map. Again, the handout goes into more information about this, but the fact is that when you drag and drop onto the map, and you don't necessarily need to be precise. Like you saw, I dropped all of them just kind of in the middle of that park. That's good enough. In some cases, I do want to be very precise because if this is a, a, an awesome picture, an awesome location, I want to, you know, in five years, oh, I'm look, oh, the conditions are going to be gorgeous next day. Let's, let's go to that spot. I want to be able to drive exactly back or walk exactly back to that spot. But in general, I'm just dragging and dropping them generally in the middle of the city or the middle of the park or the middle roughly of the area where we're talking about. And then they get all of this extra information added to them, which becomes searchable. So I can search my library now for Seattle and these pictures that I captured here locally in Seattle are all going to show up. That's powerful and I love it. I can't see the chat, so I don't know if you all are making fun of me for being a map nerd or not. Thumbs up if you think it's pretty cool, but you're not so sure you're going to get into the map side of things. I put it in here, though, because I think it is not just fun to see your pictures on a map, but that extra search term stuff really becomes useful. And that takes up a lot of time. Okay. This workshop is going to be a little bit uh, shorter. We're on to presets. And I don't see any questions right now. So. Oh, you know, I do take a quick break to show you a couple things. One, uh, right here, address lookup. I got into this by the little down triangle. Uh, address lookup, you want to make sure it does not say paused. That's what allows, when you drag and drop a picture onto a map, that's what allows Lightroom to go to the location databases and fill in the human readable language. You know, again, if I said, hey, my house is at 47 degrees north and 35 degrees south, um, no, that, that was terrible directions. That's not a real thing. I should 47 degrees north and 137 degrees west. Um, most normal people aren't going to really know where to go. But when you get in this extra sub data, you can. Another thing that's kind of cool about this is notice that you can, let's go to uh, uh, location options. You can make it private, which means you could put one of these little locations over your house. And anytime you export images, it's going to make sure it strips the location data out of them. If you're a little paranoid or you're a little cautious about sharing, you know, your neighborhood information, uh, you can do that as well. So the reverse lookup was right here under this plate. And then I see Marjorie asked about how you got into the map module. I only have a couple modules shown up here right now. If you right click on any one of them, you can see all of the rest of them show all there. They all are. But I so rarely go into book that I don't need to see it up there and slideshow and print and web. I just don't use those. So I just remove the check marks from them. So it only has the ones I'm using. Why not? Simplify. Marie Kondo that stuff. That's what I'm telling you. All right. We good with that? Um, and then as Carol says, uh, her camera can capture location using her phone. Yeah, my Sony does that too. If the connection is happy and, and connected and actually it's been working pretty well lately. As you're walking around with this connection running, the photos are automatically tagged. So then you just, they just show up on the map. You don't have to do anything other than import them in. And when Lightroom sees that data, it will automatically fetch the extra stuff. So if you've got that, you're even more golden. But my point in this workshop is to show you that if you don't have that, I still think it's worthwhile to drag and drop these onto the map because they become searchable just by dragging and dropping. It's kind of a nice way to, um, add just a little bit more data that helps you manage these pictures. All right. Okay. Um, I want to talk about presets now. Now I talked a good bit about presets in the, in the first workshop where I'm talking about importing images and I really like that auto magic preset, but presets are more than just a small set of instructions that you apply. All right. They are, um, well, they are exactly that, but they can be used in so many other places than just when you import. And for most of us, we probably have a bunch of presets that we got or bought or found um, that are in our Lightroom catalog that aren't really doing anything and are just kind of cluttering stuff up. 
including maybe some you got from me. So you might want to get rid of those. So let's go, um, I'm going to go to grid. I'm going to go down to collections and I made a collection called teaching workshop. Um, and let's move on to this picture right here. And let's go to the develop panel. So here we are in the develop panel. Uh, and let's reset. Let's see what this image looked like straight out of camera. That's what it looked like straight out of camera. Uh, I don't see my images like that very often because on import, I apply a preset called Automagic Import Preset. And you can see that it did a pretty good job. If you want to know a lot more about this, not only do I have a very specific standalone video on this on my YouTube channel, but I also talk about it in great detail and show you exactly how to build this in my first workshop. So I'm not going to show you that again. It's a pretty big difference, isn't it? So I click that and it automatically has edited my picture and um, you know done some nice things. That's a base preset I use on all of my images. Does it move the sliders the same? No, that's what the whole auto part of it is about. The latest version of Lightroom does a good job of that. Again, I'm starting to repeat myself. But my goal in this part uh, is to talk to you a little bit more in detail about setting up presets for other commonly used features within Lightroom. For instance, editing. So let's say that uh, this auto preset, it, it's a great start. And, and I do want to really drive home that point that it finishes some photos, but any photos that are my four or five stars or even three or four or five stars, I do more work to. And usually the local area adjustments. Um, and again, I covered that in the second workshop in great detail. So for instance, I'd love to do some more work on the sky. This Automagic import preset, it just affected the image as a whole. And, and it, that's limiting. There's only so far it can take an image when you're doing the global adjustments. So I want to grab my local area adjustment. And under effect, you've got all of these different effects. My goal right now is to tell you, go ahead and create some presets here that you're using often. So let's say I've got Sunset Sky Punch. Let's click that. And look what it does. It warms the temp and tint brings exposure down, highlights, shadows, and whites down a little bit, and bumps up texture clarity, dehaze, and saturation. So now I'm going to drag this across the sky. And not bad. Maybe a little too strong. Again, it's a starting point. But it's moved all of the sliders generally in the right direction that I want. And so now I feel like exposure might be a little too low. I don't want the white to get gray. There's no data there that's blown out. So you have to be careful. Highlights, just let it, let it be bright in that case. Um, and you know, it might also be a personal preference. Sometimes I go right with texture. Sometimes I go left with texture. Really like that kind of softer sky there as well. But again, the Sunset Sky Punch was a preset I created that just, boom, added over that. Let's do a new one. Can you guess what I'm going to do? Sunset Landscape. Click this, drag up from the bottom, and voila, my landscape is probably too bright. So let's bring that exposure back down a little. And you know what? In this case, I could warm it a little bit more. But again, a bunch of other sliders are moved in the direction I like. And so then I don't have to touch them. Let's remind ourselves what this image looked like straight out of camera after a bit of editing. Pretty dramatic difference. All I did was Auto Magic Import Preset and then used two graduated filters with uh, presets I've created here. So how do you create presets here? And note that these presets live across all three local area adjustments. So if I moved over to the radial, I have a sunset sky punch, and I could create a radial one of that as well. Not good. Way too far now. All right. So um, let's keep that, keep that in mind. Uh, how do you create this one? Okay, so I'm going to double click effect, reset everything. And let's say that, um, gosh, what do we have back here? Let's, let's go to this image. Let's say that we wanted to make this water really blue or green or something like that. So I'm going to grab my graduated filter. I'm going to drag it over that water and drop the green bit, maybe the blue too. I, I would like it a little bit brighter. Yeah. That looks pretty neat. And texture and clarity up. So let's say that you know I've got a lot of aerial shots of waves breaking on the beach. 
Notice how it turns the beach too, too much of a color. I don't like that, so I'm going to stop somewhere around there. So I've made these changes to these sliders. Now all I need to do is right next to Effect where it says Custom Now, drop down, Save Current Settings as a new preset. I click that, and let's call this um, Bright Blue Waves or something that makes sense to you. And you can use spaces. You don't have to put it all together like that. And if you want to put an underscore in front of it, it'll be at the top of the list. Or maybe you should just let them be alphabetical as they should be. And I create. And so now when I go to a new image, um, let's reset the effects. Uh, hold on, let's go off that back here. Bright blue waves. And then I just drag and drop it. And it's already got those settings that I want. So it's a drop down, save current settings as new preset. Or you can delete it, or you can rename it if you made a mistake. Those are all down there. I've got a little list in the handout, which is available to you at uh, photorec.tv slash lightroom. Anything that you add, it doesn't just have to be a local area preset. Let's, let's continue on, though, for a minute, because I do have one more I want to show you that I think is fun. Um, and let's go on to the squirrel. I did a pen video on the squirrel earlier this year, um, or last year, I think it was actually. And let's look at what this looked like straight out of camera. A little dull and dingy, but look how that squirrel is really starting to pop now. I made two radial gradients to really make him stand out. So let's reset and reset this whole image back to default. All right, let's get our radial gradient and put it over our squirrel. And right now, it is creating bright blue waves. So let's you know, uh, double click effect to reset that. Let's increase exposure. And look, it's the outside. That's not what we want. We got to invert down at the bottom. So we're going to invert. And notice he's got a spotlight on him. And at first, it's really noticeable. When you turn that on, let's turn this off for a second. You're like, wow, he's spotlighted. Look away for a moment and then look back. And it just looks like he's got nice light on him, doesn't it? It looks quite natural, in my opinion. You could fight me if you want. So what else do we want? Let's add texture, a little bit of clarity, uh, maybe shadows up a little bit as well, and just a little bit more warmth to the light. Uh, you know, maybe this is a little bit too specific to this squirrel. And I could also kind of angle it so it's a little, get a little more of his little bushy tail. So like so. And yeah, we did texture and clarity up. So I've highlighted my subject here. Let's save this current setting as new preset and call it subject highlight. Great. But I want to further emphasize without kind of overdoing the light on the squirrel. So I'm going to duplicate this radial filter. And now I look. Here, it's OK. Look up in this little navigator window. Oh, man, that's just so fake. Clearly a big, giant, fake light right on the squirrel. So we're going to uninvert. We're going to reset. And what I want to do is exposure down and then texture and clarity down. And so suddenly, I've softened the background a little bit. Let's hit O. Again, I show this in so much detail uh, You know, uh, in that local area adjustments workshop, which was the one last week. So now, outside, because this is inverted, is not checked, outside the squirrel, anything I do is affecting outside the squirrel. I've lowered the exposure, I've lowered texture and clarity. Um, you can even add a saturation or so. And I've just kind of um, really, I'm going to bring it in real close to the squirrel. So look at this. Original after the fact. Uh, that might be a little bit overdoing it, so be careful. I always keep an eye on that navigator window up there. And maybe my I move the pin a little bit so I can see the inside one. Maybe I bring this back down just a little bit too. I don't want it to be too bright. Just to stand out just a little bit more. So the outside one, right? Nope, that's the inside one. Outside one, OK. I'm going to click and save current setting as new preset and call it dmf outside subject. And so now I have on here, I've got this dmf outside subject. I love my capitals. I don't know. Uh, that's just how it went. And then we got subject, or uh, let's see, subject highlight. 
If I wanted to, I could you know put a little one next to each of them so they kind of come up to similar in the similar name if you want. Um, so that's just a quick way to create, and then you don't have to move these sliders every time. So use these presets to save yourself time and make sure that you are getting in here and adjusting this um, and setting them up so that you are clicking just a single click or two. Let me show you another way to think about this. So that was local area adjustments presets. And notice we could even go into the brush. Let's go back here real quick. We could go to the brush, um, the brush tool. And then, um, you know, you've got, uh, what did I do? Sunset landscape. And so, you know, you can paint on there if you want it. Uh, that same, it's a little bit overdone, overdone, but you get the idea. How about if you wanted to add a vignette to this image, right? You would come down to the uh, effects panel. Let's close this. And you would open it up if you're working in solo mode and you, you know, bring the vignette down. Well, that was a lot. Why not just create a preset that just adds five vignette or 10 vignette and 15 vignette and have them listed right here. And then a single click will do that same thing for you or sharpening. Let's say you wanted to increase the sharpening on this. I've got a setting for sharpen 65. It's a little bit more than my default sharpening. And so that bumps it up and sharpens it a little bit more. Instead of just going to the detail panel and moving this to 65 and 1.2 very quick. Now, I caution you, when you're working on your very favorite images, I do want you to touch each one of these sliders because you really want to control how it looks for each image exactly. But when you're working on family photos or you're going through and you're trying to figure out whether it's a keeper or not or whether it's responding while editing, it is certainly nice to come over here and with a single click, add features and functions to this photo just very simply with a single click. So keep that in mind. Uh, I suggest presets like you could have one for a low sharpening, a medium sharpening, and a high sharpening. And, and the easy way to do this is you just kind of pick any picture, hit the reset on it, go to the one panel you want to work with, and say, so let's say I want to do a, a 100 sharpening. That's I never do 100 sharpening, but let's just 100. And then the radius of 1.2. Um, and I talk about this in that other workshop as well. And the detail, um, I'm going to bump up to 50. Uh, so there those settings are. Masking is really too individual for picture to picture. So I'm not going to do anything like that. I'm going to come over here to the presets. I'm going to click the preset, create preset. And um, I just want sharpening and process version checked. And I'm going to say sharpen 100 and create. And so now I can do the auto magic import preset. And then I can add Sharpen 100. It doesn't take away from the Automagic Import preset. It just affects the changes I've made. Because when we went in there, um, we went when we went and edited that preset or created that preset, we had all the rest of the boxes unchecked. So it leaves those settings as is and only messes with the settings that we've added. Does that make sense? It's pretty good there. Um, I think that's a really powerful way to save yourself some time. There's even back on the import dialog, you can set presets, not just for editing, but for where the pictures go and what they're named and all of that stuff. Um, the other presets that I suggest were um, local area adjustments, darkening the sky, brightening the landscape, better teeth whitening. I say better because I think Lightroom's version of the teeth whitening, which is right in here, um, teeth whitening. Uh, I think it's overdone uh, and um, I would back it off a little bit from them. But you, you might find that it's useful, but then adjust it. If you find yourself every time adjusting it, then come in here and save it um, or update it so that it works better for you. Don't constantly fight the system, folks. Um, and the eye, I use the, the better teeth whitening for eye whitening as well. And then I did show this in both other workshops export presets. When you're ready to share this with the world, do not go to file export dot 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 and put on all of your settings. Come up with presets that are one click away. Well, all right, I'll be honest with you. One click, two, well, that's a mouse over. Two clicks, two clicks away to say, okay, 
Insta Standard. For me, that puts it in a folder called Instagram that is available on Google Drive to all of my different devices in the house. So if I just suddenly want to pull up Instagram on my phone and add a picture to it that way, or on my laptop, boom, one simple export preset. And then of course, I, you can see I have a lot of them for different things. Because if I use that more than a couple of times, why not make a preset that automatically goes back and does that again and again and again? And then for some reason, at the very end, I talked about smart previews in a little bit more detail. Um, but uh, that's it. This was our shortest workshop yet, I think. So uh, cheers to that. Um, you got a few questions. I'm going to answer those, and then I'll sign off. And just remind you that, um, one, you can follow me on social media. That's much appreciated, Photorec Toby. And more importantly, at uh, photorec.tv slash Lightroom, you can access all of these workshops in their entirety, completely free, along with the handouts. And pen members, you're having all these handouts. And pen members, I'm also going to put this all together and clean it up a little bit more and give you one PDF that has all of this content together in an organized, organized system that makes sense with even a little table of contents and maybe even an index, and then call it a book. But pen members, it will be yours free. So I'll be putting that together over the next couple of weeks as well. So take a look for that or um, watch out for that in the future. So. Andrew, um, Toby mentioned using original file name when renaming, renaming files that were name, not originally named. I wonder why you can't use the import setting you used for initial import of photos. Andrew, the reason is because it will take that, uh, if you forgot to, okay, if you never renamed them, then you can take that original file name on import preset. But if they got renamed with untitled, you can't reuse the import rename because it'll stick a bunch of stuff against that old stuff that included the word untitled, and you'll end up with a very long file name. So that's why. If you, uh, but again, if you never renamed them, you can use my import preset for renaming. But otherwise, you can't. Hope that makes sense. Jamie, you pulled some images of a friend to Lightroom, and when done, it put them all over the catalog. Why did that not stay together? I labeled them. I don't know what you mean by labeled. What does it mean to label something in Lightroom? That I'm not sure. Do you mean keyworded them? And, um, and it put them all over the catalog. On import, Jamie, you decide where they should go. And you need to make sure, let's go back to screen large, file import. Let's just go file import real quick since you're here, Jamie, and we could talk about it more next week. Um, in that workshop if you want. Uh, when you import, you let's, let's copy, we say copy, you decide here in the destination where they go. The defaults by date, which then Lightroom will make lots of different folders. They'll all be next to each other, but it'll make lots of different folders. So watch out for that. John, when you hover over a collection, how to set the image shown in the navigator? Right click on the image in the set and click set to use as cover photo. So Roy nicely is answering that. I'm glad, Roy. I had never thought of that. So for instance, um, when you hover over, let's open the navigator. So John's asking, when I hover over uh, these collections, an image shows up. How do I determine which one I want to show up? For instance, maybe I want um, this elephant to show up. So you're saying I can right click on it and um, in the set and click set to use as cover photo. Set as reference photo. How about here? Set as, I don't, oh, use as cover photo right there. So now when I mouse over Tanzania, it shows the elephant. Cool. I never thought about that. Uh, I think by default, it uses the first picture in the group. And one thing that you can do is uh, you can custom order. So you could also say drag and drop an image. And I think, nope, still seems to be taking that first one. My, my theory was um, that it would be the first image in the group, uh, but doesn't seem to be. So do Roy's method of right clicking and saying use as cover photo. Good question. I'm glad I learned something new. Kathy, you want to know any su suggestions for improving Lightroom speed and function? One, Roy wrote a great document that goes through a series of steps you should try. Um, and I think that's all I have to answer about that. So uh, reach out to us. We'll get you that document. 
Uh, we typically reserve it for PEN members. I can't remember. I know Heather, your daughter has joined PEN. I can't remember if you have, but we'll send it to you. Um, it's got some great tips in there. That If there is one complaint about Lightroom, is it is that it's not as fast as it always could be. Um, but honestly, when I've tried some of the other programs, they're not so fast either when you're working with a lot of photos and pictures. One simple thing is to keep your catalog fairly small and lean. That might help as well. So, um, and as Roy puts out, points out in the little notes that I'm looking at, this article is available already for PEN members. So Kathy, if you are, um, just do a search for Lightroom performance. Um, but if not, send us an email. We'll get it to you. All right. Okay. Folks, if you're not a PEN member, you, you're going to miss a great opportunity coming up to have detailed discussions, Q&A coming up next week, plus, of course, a fantastic community. And David wrote something really, I think, touching the other day. In, in this time of so many of us isolated at home, having a community of folks that, that share similar interests and, and excitements is just a really special place. Um, and I think is important. So if you're struggling a bit, $24 for a year, a fantastic community, an unbelievable uh, resource, and it's just a really good, um, it's just a really good service that I'm proud of. So you can check out more about that at photorec.tv slash pen. If you've watched this long and you haven't already hit subscribe, please do so. That helps me. And that thumbs up is much appreciated as well. And forward this or the emails that you got today along with your friends and family that have any interest in photography so that you can share it with them as well. I really appreciate that. It helps me. It helps me. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I probably will be back with more free public workshops, but right now the only other thing planned is the special pen members Q&A coming next week at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, that is Tuesday. I think that's the 28th. That would be right, right? All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. If you're not watching this live, thank you for tuning in. I hope you'll check out the other workshops as well. Thanks so much.